All right. Looks like we're recording. So uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. I mentioned this is our first of two Association Virtual Legislative Trainings. We uh, we wanted to, you know, obviously be in person, and it's tough not to be in person, and things are going to be different this year in the State House, and we'll have some uh, some information on that here from Cress during his presentation. But we want to take the opportunity to get folks, you know, some of the uh, tips and tricks and knowledge to kind of help contact our legislators during this legislative session. It's going to be an important one. Okay. Well, thanks again for all you guys do. I uh, see a lot of familiar names in the squares. Um, maybe we'll see some actual faces here in a little bit. Let's uh, head to the next slide here. Uh, what we want to try to cover here in our hour um, is to introduce you to the 122nd Indiana General Assembly coming up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how the legislature uh, is constructed. Uh, I call it the citizens' legislature, a little different than the federal model where we have part-time legislators. These folks have other jobs, other professions. Um, we'll talk about key committees that impact the, uh, the districts, uh, a little bit about the state capitol, where things uh, take place. Um, then we'll talk about lawmaking, how it happens. Um, I've used a, a recent example of your effectiveness in getting a law changed or uh, amended. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the timeline of the session, the calendar. Um, We'll spend some time on uh, this new world uh, being impacted by the pandemic. It certainly is going to have an uh, impact on how we operate here in this uh, General Assembly. Uh, we don't know how things quite worked back in 1918 in the last pandemic, um, but there has been a legislative study committee uh, trying to make uh, it as safe and healthy as, as we can. Uh, thank goodness for the web and the technology, even though we've had a few bugs here and there, just like we uh, suffered in getting the meeting started. Uh, thank goodness we do have the uh, live streaming uh, that we can use. And then we'll spend some time with questions and uh, Joe can jump in as well. As I mentioned, uh, our Constitution, um, Article 1 of the Constitution, it's important to note that it established the legislative branch. As you recall from civics, uh, we're a republic. We have three branches of equal government. Um, again, Article One is describing the legislative function. Um, Article Two is the uh, executive branch, uh, the president, the governor, if you will. And then the third is the uh, judicial. Uh, we use that federal model here in Indiana. Just a refresher on the, the uh, General Assembly itself, you'll see the slide here. Uh, your House of Representatives, the People's House, if you will, uh, is made up of 100 members. Uh, these are two-year terms. We've just been through the cycle. What's important about uh, the House, uh, particularly in a budget session, is okay. all spending uh, bill. Uh, comes through uh, the House of Representatives. Okay, uh, the 122nd Indiana General Assembly, uh, the 100 members, it's a two-year term. Again, the important thing for us in the budget cycle is all the spending uh, ideas that are originated in the House, uh, ways and means. We'll talk about uh, key committee here in a little bit. The political makeup, uh, the Republicans continue to control uh, in a supermajority both the House and the Senate. In the recent election, the Democrats actually lost seats in the House, uh, up to five seats flipped. So you see the numbers there, 71 Republicans, 29 Democrats. Uh, we've got a fairly new speaker. He took over at the end of the last session. Uh, Representative Brian Bosma retired. Uh, Representative Todd Houston is our new speaker. Uh, incidentally, he's a uh, uh, he's the uh, rep for Joe. So Fishers, Indiana, it's one of the boom areas of Indiana. Uh, I think he's actually a former neighbor of yours, right, Joe? 
You see the Senate now, um, 50 members, big difference. It's a four-year term, um, a 25 run uh, in a split cycle. Um, the political makeup, uh, 39 Republicans, 11 Democrats. Again, uh, that's a supermajority. What that means is really they don't need Democrats to conduct business. Uh, you only need uh, two-thirds to um, start the session uh, with a quorum. Uh, interesting enough, uh, the Democrats did pick up one seat. Uh, that was here in uh, Marion County. Uh, the incumbent John Ruckel's house lost that seat. Um, and interesting, uh, the new senator is our first uh, uh, Muslim in the uh, General Assembly. Uh, the president of the Senate is our lieutenant governor by constitution. She serves the, the presiding officer. Uh, if you recall from our state house tours, uh, she has offices right next to the chamber that uh, adds to the convenience. Uh, she does have uh, the tie-breaking vote, although that's fairly rare. Uh, the uh, majority uh, leader of the Senate is Speaker Pro Tem. Um, Rod Bray is uh, uh, coming up on his second uh, big session. Uh, his father and his grandfather both were legislators. Uh, he's a, considered a, a good friend of the district's. Uh, Morgan County had a, a round table with him. He's very open, and uh, I believe he was uh, 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 able to attend, uh, attend uh, last year's uh, conference as well. Uh, Joe, next slide, please. Sure thing. Yeah, Chris, you were right. Todd Houston moved out of the neighborhood right as I moved in, so we were just passing each other. <laughs> very good. Uh, I mentioned that Indiana is a little different than our federal model where you have full-time uh, Congress folks. Uh, uh, we still cling to the tradition of a citizen's legislature. Uh, these are part-time folks. Um, many are lawyers. Um, it used to be in the old days, many were farmers. Uh, but as society has changed, uh, that's obviously different. We have teachers, uh, insurance agents, realtors, a wide variety of uh, professions. And, that brings a unique dynamic to the process, uh, as we uh, will uh, talk about a little bit earlier. Um, this is considered a long session uh, on odd numbers year. Uh, odd numbered years, we uh, spend the, the, the bulk of the session, the 60 working days, uh, uh, on uh, the budget. Um, one interesting other important task um, that we face uh, is every 10 years we have a census. And the state legislatures around the country are also uh, charged with redrawing uh, uh, the district lines. Um, and obviously, again, with a supermajority of Republicans, uh, they get to draw the lines. So it's an important uh, function that's added uh, to the uh, uh, long session this year. Um, the short session is in even numbered years. Uh, those are only 30 working days. Uh, the governor does have the authority to call special sessions. These are again, fairly rare. There's only been a few in the, my experience, mainly over uh, budget items, but uh, sometimes other issues pop up. The last one I'll mention is uh, interim or summer study committees, even though most of them don't happen to the fall. The most recent example of that would be the carbon uh, issue that uh, uh, retiring Senator uh, Stoops from Bloomington uh, was successful in getting heard. And uh, we monitored these for you. Another recent example would be the stormwater study uh, that Joe uh, was appointed to, as well as uh, uh, one of our Jasper County uh, supervisors. Next slide, Joe. I mentioned uh, uh, in our topics of the importance uh, of key committees. Um, committees is where uh, a lot of our uh, work starts in the process. You'll see on the House side, uh, I've, I've listed uh, the key committees, in my opinion, starting with Ag and Rural Development. Uh, Don Leahy is a, a veteran chair of that committee. Uh, he is a farmer from Brookston in the White County area. 
uh, a new uh, assignment, uh, which is interesting to us, is Environmental Affairs, uh, representing Duke Goop Wine from Francisville area. Uh, his family's got a, a rich background in agribusiness, seed and popcorn. Uh, he is new to that committee, uh, fairly conservative. He replaces the retired uh, David Wilkins uh, from the Warsaw area, who uh, chaired this committee for several years. Uh, next would be natural resources. Uh, this would impact a lot of our friends at DNR, uh, Lake and River uh, Forestry. Uh, Sean Eberhardt has chaired that committee for the past few sessions. Uh, he is a small business owner from the Shelbyville area. I mentioned public policy here because uh, uh, this sometimes comes into play. Um, one of the proposals that we'll be talking about in the session is proposed cigarette tax. Uh, public policy uh, normally handles what I call the sin taxes, uh, gaming, alcohol, tobacco. Uh, recently, it's been hemp and marijuana. Uh, public policy is someone uh, that we need to watch. And uh, last but not least is the uh, importance of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Speaker Todd Houston chaired this committee in the last cycle um, due to the uh, motorcycle accident that Dr. Brown had up in Michigan. Dr. Brown is a retired uh, emergency room physician from the Crawfordsville area. He is well enough now to take that chair back. And um, he is a very important key figure in how the budget is crafted. The governor does submit his budget, but uh, normally the legislative branch basically says, okay, we'll use it as guidance but we're going to start our own process. Now, switching over to the Senate, um, we have an interesting uh, relationship there between the Ag Committee and the Natural Resource Committee, uh, chaired by Gene Leising and Susan Glick, um, both veterans of the process. They actually room together during the session, and these committees are nearly, if, if not identical, in, um, in their membership. Um, the Environmental Affairs Committee uh, is, again, very important, mainly for forestry. Um, and uh, we know that there'll be some uh, discussions about uh, maybe a carbon uh, public policy approach. And uh, we hear that uh, the chair of that committee, uh, Mark Mesmer, uh, will actually be authoring that bill. Um, most of it uh, will be coming from recommendations, we think, from the Summer Study Committee. The last two are very uh, key as the budget uh, process uh, switches from the House to the Senate. Uh, we have two players there, uh, Appropriations, which is chaired by uh, uh, Senator Ryan Mishler. He's a funeral home owner from Bremen, Indiana. We have a good relationship with him uh, through our districts up there. Um, mainly through Jamie Scott, our legislative committee chair, knows him very personally. And then uh, the tax and physical po fiscal policy uh, is chaired by Senator Holman uh, from the Markle area. So these are key committees that we'll be working with uh, as we go forward. Joe, next slide, please. <clears throat> Where will the process be? It is the Indiana Capitol. Now, the one picture on the left is what I call the government campus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the campus as we uh, adjust to uh, changes uh, dictated by the Summer Study Committee dealing with COVID-19, how we're going to operate the session. Um, and then the picture on the right is uh, what's affectionately called by lobbyists and legislators and visitors as the halls. It's a beautiful building. I know many of you have been there. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to have a lot of folks in the building due to COVID, um, but um, it, it is a beautiful building and it is the people's house. Uh, the next slide, Joe. Do you recognize these folks? <clears throat> I hope so. Uh, we've really worked hard and uh, very thankful for all the districts that have uh, devoted some days to uh, come visit and influence the process. Uh, 
the the uh, gentleman in the middle in the suit is uh, a retired legislator from the Jay County, uh, Adams County area, uh, Representative Baumer. Um, and I believe these are district folks uh, uh, from Jay County that were very helpful in that process uh, that we're going to go through as an example of how a bill becomes a law. Next slide, please. We tried to simplify the uh, legislative process for you. Um, and where we are right now is this first box. Uh, proposals, ideas are flooding into uh, the state house. Uh, legislators are uh, instructing uh, a, a nonpartisan agency that does the work in drafting legislation. It's called the Legislative Services Agency, uh, mainly lawyers. They take uh, ideas that are flowing uh, into legislators uh, and start putting them on paper. Um, what happens then with those bill drafts is they'll start accumulating into uh, bill lists that uh, legislators and leaders of the uh, Senate and the House will start assigning uh, uh, first readings, uh, which leads then to committee assignments in that third box. Um, the committees then uh, will uh, digest, uh, debate, uh, have hearings, take testimony on the uh, bill itself. And if it meets their approval uh, and passage, it then goes back to the floor of the respective chamber uh, for what's called a second reading. Second readings uh, are available and open to amendments or changes. Um, then it uh, takes its form for a floor vote and gets then uh, moved into the third reading box for further debate. Uh, very rarely does amendments uh, take place at this stage, uh, but a final vote then is taken by the full chamber. If it passes that uh, hurdle, it then is assigned into the opposite chamber. Uh, Senate bills assigned to the House, House bills assigned to the Senate. It goes through the identical same process. Leadership uh, will assign it to committees. Committees will have hearings, testimony, um, votes. It then goes back to the chamber floor for any possible amendments, a vote uh, to a third reading for final debates. If in fact the version is different between the chambers, it will go then into what's called a conference committee. Leadership appoints two from each chamber to hash it out in an open transparent process uh, that others can uh, view and have input into if in fact there's no differences, they can kind of uh, go ahead and, and consent and the bill is sent to the governor for uh, action. Uh, if, if there is a, a, a dissent, they can hammer out a compromise and issue then a final agreement uh, for passage. It goes to the governor. The governor has actually three uh, options. He can sign the bill, making it effective. He can sit on it for a number of days and then it passes, or he can veto it. So that is the uh, quick and dirty uh, process that has to happen uh, in 60 working days. Next slide, Joe. Chris, before we go on, uh, can you maybe speak to how, uh, you kind of talked how the bill go through the process, where the bill might die along that process, or the most common places that bills quote unquote die? Uh, sure. Um, Go, goes back to the power of the committee chair. The committee chair uh, with influence from uh, his caucus and leadership uh, has really a lot of power to whether a bill uh, advances. That's really the first big step is willing, uh, the willingness of the committee chair to actually hear the bill. Um, it can also then uh, get stopped in uh, second reading, um, it can obviously fail uh, on a third reading uh, a vote of the majority to uh, kill the bill. Um, 
there's a, a variety of other uh, processes that keeps a bill alive. Uh, the converse of killing a bill would be uh, resurrecting it in uh, uh, in the form of an amendment into a, a bill that's still alive. So the old saying is, you never say never. Uh, so these ideas can float about uh, and re-enter the process at any point during uh, any of these boxes. Um, but I think uh, it's important to know that, again, leaders and chairs really do have a lot of power over the fate uh, of the bill itself. Does that make Chris, sense? Yeah, Chris, you mentioned uh, resurrecting it in another bill. So how do you get it into another bill? Do you have to go to the author of that bill? Uh, protocol would say you go to the author. Uh, again, these uh, ideas are talked about within closed doors of the caucus itself. Uh, colleagues can approach another colleague and say, listen, uh, due to uh, some other problems, uh, my bill did not get heard. Uh, would you be available to uh, consider a, a floor amendment, a second reading amendment to put the idea back in? Um, uh, that is the typical approach, um, and we'll kind of see this uh, idea um, in fruition in the uh, example of, uh, that we did uh, on behalf of the districts uh, uh, per the resolution process. Thanks, Greg. I'll go ahead. And I think we're ready for the next slide, Joe. Here is the case study, uh, Soil and Water. Uh, it was uh, originally called Senate Bill 238. Um, if you recall uh, from some of your visits to the State House, if you see a three-numbered bill, it's always a Senate bill. The House uses four digits. Uh, so this was a Senate bill, uh, and you can see the first uh, box there. Um, our friends at uh, Department of Ag and DNR needed some uh, what was called technical corrections to the law, uh, the Indiana Code. Um, and parallel that, during your conference that year, uh, Delaware uh, SWCD uh, submitted a resolution that passed your uh, governance process uh, via a resolution uh, allowing uh, districts to accept uh, other sources of the matching funding. Um, uh, due to the timing, um, we weren't able to take that resolution then uh, from the beginning of the um, original intent of Senate Bill uh, 238. And you see the second box then, uh, that was assigned to uh, Senator Glick's uh, Senate Natural Resource Committee, and uh, she then uh, took the bill and got it through her committee on a due pass of seven to zero. Um, meanwhile, we were uh, behind the scenes working with Senator Glick um, in uh, getting ideas of inserting an amendment uh, based on our resolution, um, but we weren't quite ready uh, to do it in the Senate uh, so the bill then came over to the House, and uh, uh, it, it was picked up by a, a young uh, state rep from the Terre Haute area that we had some connections with through the local districts, uh, Representative uh, uh, Morrison. Uh, he then agreed uh, to help us in the first reading as it was assigned to the Senate Natural Resource Committee. Um, Finally, he suggested we work with uh, Representative Balmer, uh, who happened to represent that uh, Delaware County uh, district, and we were able to submit to him uh, an amendment uh, language uh, that would fulfill our resolution. If you'll go on the next slide, Joe. So, uh, to carry the story forward to success, uh, Baumer and Morrison uh, worked together uh, with our assistance. We approached Senator Glick uh, and uh, all uh, the other uh, respective uh, important folks, including the 
House Natural Resource Chair, Sean Everhart, and uh, we got it in amended form and it passed out of the House Natural Resource Committee the way we wanted it, 12 to nothing. It then moved through the process in a very orderly and progressive fashion and actually ended up um, being signed by the governor. So uh, we're not always uh, batting a thousand, but uh, uh, that's um, a success story um, for the Soil and Water District uh, Resolution and Governance and uh, Progress Report. I don't think, do we have any questions about that, Joe? I don't see any right now, Chris. Okay, well, let's uh, go to the next slide here. Um, these are the key deadlines. And again, you'll see that uh, I've marked them unofficial. Um, due to COVID, uh, the process has been slowed down quite a bit because there's been very little face-to-face -face meetings among the legislators and leadership. But typically, this is what a long session uh, calendar would look like. I do know that they have announced that the session will begin on January 4th. That's a traditional uh, first Tuesday start date. Um, typically, uh, we have until the middle of January, both in the House and Senate, to actually file bills. Um, due to COVID, uh, we're being told that uh, both the House and Senate leaders have instructed members that they will place a, a limit uh, on the number of bills to be filed at 10 or less. Uh, typically, we'll have anywhere from 12 to 1400 bills um, uh, drafted uh, in a long session. Uh, so you can kind of do the math if there's 150 uh, House and Senators, uh, 10, that's still gonna be a lot of paper. Um, so I think, uh, uh, 10 bill limits uh, usually are a guide, but uh, sometimes uh, it gets shortened and I suspect uh, leaders will try to shorten that list uh, again due to COVID and timing. Uh, third reading, these are important dates. If the bill is not uh, heard and through that first half of the process, by typically the end of February, um, they die. Uh, again, uh, earlier uh, conversations, uh, a bill is not dead if uh, uh, it can be resurrected at times. Uh, again, we go through that same second chamber process, so that next big important deadline uh, traditionally is mid-April uh, to complete the uh, both House and Senate passage, um, and then it goes to conference. Uh, conference committees usually take a week and the, the Constitution calls for what's called the Latin term sine die, or the end of the session is the end of April. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I mentioned all through the presentation that this is gonna be a, a abnormal or very uh, challenging um, uh, session due to uh, the pandemic. Uh, there has been a joint house uh, summer study group called the Legislative Continuity Committee to explore how they're gonna operate. So far, we know in detail that the house is gonna move their operation over to the government center south. That is the newest building on the campus. Uh, it's where we typically have our lunch during the uh, uh, state house visits, but um, uh, it's a massive space. Um, it's got uh, plenty of uh, meeting rooms, and uh, that's where they're gonna be both conducting floor acti act activities and, and committees. Uh, the Senate has chosen to stay in the uh, actual state house. They've uh, commandeered the uh, viewing gallery to get social distancing uh, for the 50 senators, and they will be utili utilizing uh, both the House and Senate uh, committee hearing rooms within the building itself. Um, they've emphasized safety and health. Um, the uh, leadership has again asked uh, members to limit bills. Um, 
as many of you know, a lot of the time taken on the floor is to honor folks back home, uh, high school champions, uh, uh, resolutions they're called. Um, I suspect leaders have asked members to really restrict, uh, again, due to COVID, uh, the number of resolutions um, that uh, will take time on the floor. Um, the remote testimony and schedules will impact us as we try to comment uh, and give testimony on bills. Um, all these will be uh, uh, being uh, uh, done remotely through um, the internet. Um, the State House and the Government Center uh, both uh, have uh, supposedly the latest technology. We've had the web uh, for the last five sessions, um, but it is going to be a learning process, just like sessions we're having right now. Um, the biggest challenge I think we'll have is uh, this uh, uh, government center south, where the house will convene and the state house itself will be uh, severely restricted uh, for events and group visits. Um, we don't know all the details of what those restrictions might be, what the numbers are allowed, um, but we'll be getting that and sharing that with you. Uh, there's quite a bit of debate about masks and social distancing requirements. Uh, the governor still has a mask uh, uh, recommendation, but again, uh, the separation of powers, uh, the legislative branch has said, we're going to do our own thing. Now, there was only a handful of legislators that didn't wear a mask during the so-called organizational day that took place right before Thanksgiving. But um, there's quite a bit of debate about um, masks and social distancing and how that's going to work. The State House and the Government Center will have plenty of cleaning protocols, and there'll be um, many, many hand sanitizing uh, uh, stations throughout the buildings. Next slide, please. So having said all that, um, we wanted to uh, emphasize that um, we're going to be working hard to keep um, as much transparency and communications back to the districts as we can. I will continue to supply uh, staff um, weekly bill trackers. Uh, what we're going to be encouraging, we'll be probably discussing a lot of these ideas in our next uh, week session, is a, a stronger emphasis on back home town hall opportunities to meet your legislators. Uh, many of them have weekly back home. Uh, typically, the schedule includes taking the day to go back to their districts on Fridays Many of them have coffee shops and whatnot meetings on Saturdays uh, back in the district. So we need to really emphasize taking advantage of those opportunities. We also encourage you to stay close to local media. I know there's still some newspapers out there, but uh, local uh, media is still a very important uh, partner. Uh, social media, a lot of our younger members, many of our, our, our districts are very comfortable with social media. Uh, we're going to need to use this tool even more. And of course, websites, and I've, I've put a link here, um, always have this link available so that you can monitor the General Assembly and committees. They're all online, and uh, this will be a very important uh, portal uh, for us to conduct our business. And with that, uh, Joe, um, I think we're ready for questions or comments or anything. And again, I apologize. I wasn't quite up to speed with our technology today, but I promise to get better. Well, thank, thanks, Chris, for presenting. I'll open the chat box here. Um, so first, first question in the chat here, Chris, we got one. Um, how can we find out about town hall events in our area? Um, it, and here it says, <clears> it always seems that any information received about upcoming events or in the newspaper the day of, which is kind of tricky when they're, most of them are like evenings outside of work, you know, how, how can they find out about them in advance? I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing my well, screen and uh, bring everybody up here. Sorry, real quick, Chris, and if people want to turn on. Okay. Here. But um, yeah, I'll, but yeah, go ahead, Chris. 
Uh, a great question. Um, it's kind of all of the above, but um, what we're wanting to encourage, and again, we'll, we'll visit more in detail in next week's session, um, is uh, heighten our awareness uh, and connectivity to the respective members. Uh, many of them, if not all of them, have their own websites now. Uh, many of them have um, great young staff members uh, that post calendars, and we'll uh, be working on um, um, those kind of connections more and more back to you uh, in real time. Um, there is a mass, uh, master calendar uh, posted by Legislative Services, um, but we're still not sure how that's going to operate. So um, I guess uh, we'll have to work a little harder to get you connected, but we'll commit to do that in these strange times. Chris, one thing I wanted to mention in terms of communication with with COVID, obviously large group settings is discouraged. So I wanted to mention, and we'll probably talk about it next Wednesday as well, but talking to legislators over things like Zoom is something that's been happening more often. I participated over the summer in a, in a round table with three legislators on Zoom, and it's interesting with a small group on Zoom or another kind of video chat, it's it's not as weird as you would think it is. <laughs> Still not, doesn't, doesn't um, replace the in-person. So one of the things that we are gonna look at, and I've talked already with Chris about this, is maybe we can try to hook districts up with their legislator over like a Zoom chat like this. The other thing, Chris, you mentioned the kind of coffee shop type chats that you know it's also acceptable to try to reach out to your legislator and see if you can meet with them one-on-one -on -one, invite them maybe to your to your farm or or you know something like that um, and so i think i guess in my mind i i see those maybe one-on-one -on -one meetings more important this year as well as maybe just phone calls yeah the, the personal relationship um, is going to be uh, even more critical and again, that's why I think we need to emphasize that not everything uh, happens uh, in Indianapolis, that it's probably more important that we develop those uh, relationships back home. I know we emphasize that in some of our training uh, with local government, uh, county commissioners and county councilmen uh, and mayors, but uh, uh, during the session, it's going to be uh, important that we uh, get them back home as well. Chris, can you talk a little bit about kind of communication among partners? You know, you kind of hinted at it <clears throat> when you talked about the example bill. Um, how, how does communication flow at the state house between like lobbyists and interest groups and that kind of thing? Uh, can you give us, give us a little bit of information on that? Well, again, that's going to be a, a, a challenge, Joe, um, with COVID um, is, um, I'm probably old school, but I still believe that showing up every day and having face-to-face -face contact with colleagues is still an important way to get things done. Um, with restrictions now, lobbyists, uh, uh, partners, uh, we're going to have to work in, in, in different ways of exchanging ideas and positions. So uh, that's something we're going to have to probably uh, lean into is finding some new ways to compare notes and standing in the hall outside the chambers or outside committee rooms. But we'll, uh, we'll figure that out. Um, a lot of Zoom calls. I know Farm Bureau, I've been on uh, several of their uh, Tuesday uh, at noon. Uh, we may, uh, Joe uh, and Amy, need to be doing some of those ourselves. Uh, as bills uh, become uh, posted, I know we'll have several um, that have, uh, impact the, the districts and we'll, we'll be on top of those, but uh, we're just going to have to work in some of these new ways. Well, I don't see any more questions right now, Chris. Um, you know, I think that we'll, we'll get this rec recording posted. And uh, I guess the one thing I would say to folks on, on here too, is that Chris, you send out your your um, update every week, but folks can reach out to you about questions too. And I think that's 
I tend to get some questions during the session, but you know, feel free to reach out to Crest too to clarify some things and we'll, we'll work in hand to, to help you understand what's going on. I do my best with everything else going on to keep my uh, <laughs> ear, ear to the ground and figuring out what's going on you know, along with what Crest gives me, but um, sometimes you just gotta reach out to Crest and say, so what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, again. It's a privilege to serve you all, and uh, I always appreciate hearing from folks back home. Um, and I know these issues will pop up uh, again. We have several uh, proposals uh, being uh, floated around carbon uh, being a big issue. I know we're still dealing with some drainage law uh, that we'll uh, see, but uh, again, uh, uh, defending clean water, uh, defending our budget. Uh, we know uh, with COVID, uh, the world has changed. Uh, uh, the budget's going to be a very difficult uh, lift, but uh, we'll be there. Uh, we'll have boots on the ground for sure. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I hope you all have a, a good afternoon. Chris, thanks for presenting.